We lose half our congregation when all those kids leave, and that's a good thing. I'm thankful again for Pastor Tom allowing me to share the gospel this morning. Um, you know, I, I want to share something on friendship today. And I wasn't going to do this, but uh, we all need a friend. I want to share some things about friendship and things that go on here. Uh, but I have to share quickly. I had a friend when I come to Christ, a very dear friend. Most of you know him. His name was Michael Inman. And one time in a service, the pastor asked Mike to put together a service. And uh, Mike said, you're going to speak on He Give me the the passage and everything. I said, Mike, I can't do that. Yeah, you're going to do it. There was three or four of us going to speak, and you're going to do this. And I was scared to death. In school, I avoided every, everything I could to get up in front of a class. I was a little farm boy. I didn't want no part of being in front of people. But he insisted. And I've had more opportunities to do this. And I've found that, and I want to share that with you, one of the things we'll talk about, people who we need friends in our lives who see things in us we don't see in ourselves. And Mike was one of those friends. But I'm so thankful for his friendship as a new Christian. Father, we thank you again today for our opportunity to come together on this Lord's Day, to worship and honor and glorify your name. And Lord, we, we pray that what is done here is pleasing in your sight. And we ask a Father's blessing upon it. And Father, as we, as we share this message this morning, I would pray, by the grace of Almighty God, the meditations of our hearts and the words of of my mouth might be acceptable in your sight. And we might leave this place saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Bless your people, I pray. Holy Spirit, have your way in our midst. And we'd ask it all in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Today, I, uh, as I share, I titled this nation, this, this message, I'm not good with titles, and Pastor Tom always says, what's your title, what's your title? I'm not good with titles. So I finally give in, and I said, okay, we're going to call this, We All Need a Friend. We All Need a Friend. And I'm primarily sharing with you today about a Christian friend. We need a Christian friend, if not friends in our lives. And I want to share with you why that is so true in our lives. Pastor Tom over the last few weeks has shared with you about the divine directions in everyday decisions we make for our lives. And he shared, first of all, we, is to start. We must start. And I remember this from Pastor Tom's message. He's, the, the stickers on cars that say, the Lord is my co-pilot, God is my co-pilot. I'm like with Pastor Tom. I don't like those either. The Lord, if you want to start, the Lord must be your pilot. And I heard this saying some years ago that I like maybe more than being your pilot, and this is it. Jesus is Lord of all, now get this, or he's not Lord at all. In the very first sermon that was preached, they said, what must we do to be saved? And the disciples said to them, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice something there. He didn't say, believe the Lord will save you. He says, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. For us to start, we must believe that he is Lord, and he is Lord of all, and he has right to every area of our lives. The next thing he shared with us, it was stop. Stop. In our lives, many times, God says to us, in more ways than one, through circumstances, what I like to call the providence of God, through people, through his word, 
to something that can happen to our health. There's something that can happen in our personal lives. And God says, stop. And when he says that, we must do that. We must stop. The next thing he shared was was go. And I, what I got from his message was sometimes God says go, and it's not comfortable to go. I just shared with you many, many years ago, someone saying, I want you to do that. I can't do that. But sometimes God says go, and he wants you to move forward. And you may feel all alone when God says that to you, like no one will go with you. And there's an old song, and part of that song says, though no one follow, yet I will go. And sometimes you have to go it alone when God speaks to you. Another thing he, he shared with us was stay. And I got, stay came before go, and I got, got out of sequence here. But he says stay. And this is one of the words I love from the word of God, because stay says to me, you persevere. You don't, you quit. You persevere veer through this and in one of the stories that the author of the book that that pastor tom is is sharing with us one of the stories he tells about was when he was in high school and he was a a tennis player and he played one of the best tennis players in the whole state or something at that time and i'm kind of paraphrasing here i don't remember the whole story exactly but he played this guy as one of the last matches of his high school career and all these scouts from all these colleges who were giving away scholarships came to see him. And, and, and he came to see this guy. He's playing, and the guy, he beats the guy. And as soon as he beats the guy, these guys with scholarships walk right by the guy, and they walk up to him, and they offer him a scholarship to play tennis, a full-ride scholarship, as I remember. And he received that, and he went to, to college, and for the first two or three years, I don't think he won, a, I don't remember, maybe one or two matches. And he was fro- frustrated at getting beat so bad one time, he just, he just came apart. He blew up, and he, he, just <coughs> he just went to pieces. And walked off. His coach, his high school coach, heard about it. And he drove, a, he drove for an hour and a half to where he was. And he went in and he started to encourage him. And he said, said to him, you're not a quitter and you're not going to quit. You know, sometimes we need people in our lives to speak to us that way. You're not a quitter. You're not going to quit. You go back out there. You apologize to your teammates. You apologize to your coach. And you get back out on the court and you play. The next year, which I believe was his senior year, he was voted the school's most outstanding athlete because he realized, yeah, he was there, but he really wasn't putting in the time to be the kind of tennis player that he should have been. But he had somebody in his life said, you persevere. Don't you quit. We need those people in our lives. We sure do. Now, last week he talked about serve. And simply serving is, you know, Jesus said this, I came not to be served, but to serve. He also said to his disciples, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest among them. And Jesus simply said, you want to be great? Then you be a servant. That's how you can be great. And the greatest among you will be servant of all. Now, I want to say this. Because we think of serving as doing, 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 doing. That has a lot to be with being a servant. But being a servant is also an attitude. To have a servant mindset like Jesus had. And I believe it begins with a mindset that says, I am a servant before you do anything. Because if you do things without having a servant attitude, it's going to turn sour in your belly, and it will get bad. So we need all those things in our lives, and we need to make these decisions. And these are div- divine direction in our life, and they're all good, and they come from God. 
The last the chapter that, that I'm sharing from the book is called Connect. And the point is, we have to be connected as Christians. We have to be connected. For us to hear the, what God has to say to us, there are three, three avenues he speaks to us. And Pastor Tom shared two of those. He speaks to us, and I believe primarily through his word. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a good workman, not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to study the word. I'm not just talking about reading the word of God. We need to study it and meditate upon it and chew it over in our lives. We don't want to be nominal Christians. We want to have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ, and this is the way we obtain it. The next is the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit speaks to us, and he's always, he never says something to us contrary to the Word of God. And I, I have to share this. And I, I, Years ago, I first became a Christian, and we went to Bible studies, and, and I was so excited about being a Christian. And, and I had a cousin, and she was in a Bible study, and she came and said, well, this guy is in our Bible study. And he said, the Lord told him to divorce his wife. Now, what was that in the Word of God? You don't find that in the Word of God. Mr. Spurgeon said this. He said, anything that comes good from me and is godly for me, you give God the glory. Anything that isn't, you give me the glory. So we make a decision contrary to the Word of God, and we all do that at times. God forgives. I'm, I'm so thankful for His grace. But don't give the glory to God. Don't say God told me. Just say, I really messed up. The Bible says we confess our sins. He's faithful and just forgive us our sins. And he's to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't give God the glory. Give the glory to yourself. And there is a third way that God speaks to us. And that is through others. Other Christians in our lives. And I really believe this. When God puts the three together, you go forward or you stop, or you serve, or you start. When God puts the three together, it, to me it's like a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When God speaks to you, he speaks to his, through his word, through his Holy Spirit, and through other Christians as you fellowship with them. And I, I just picked up a few quotes. And again, my, my title here is, We All Need a Friend. Show me your friends. These are a few quotes I picked up, and I will show you your future. I believe that is very true. You are who you run with. And maybe some of you as young people are older now, that parents told you that. You are who you run with. And we've heard this one. I haven't heard much anymore, but you cannot soar with the eagles if you run with the turkeys. We all know that's pretty true, isn't it? And the last one, this is one I just picked up recently. I think Tom might have put it on Facebook, some old sayings, but this is an old farmer saying, when you wallow with the pigs, expect to get dirty. And I think that is very true in life. So just to share, this is a quote from sociologists. And this is what they say about the people we run with. Many socialists say that you eventually become the average of your five closest friends. Your morals will be similar to your five closest buddies. Your finances will look a lot like those of the people you spend the most time with. And this is the most important one as Christians. This is the, the most important one. Your spiritual profession, or lack of it, will be similar to those who have the most influence in your life. And I believe those things are all true. So what is a friend? I fear today we look at friendship as, yeah, a guy told me other here a while back, and I don't remember the exact number, but it was over 300 people he had in his super phone, or what do you call those phones today, 
he had 300 contacts. He says, I have 300 people. And I fear that he calls them his friends. Those are just acquaintances. They are not friends. So what is a friend? What is a friend? I started to look this up in a dictionary, and I thought, nope, I'm going to go to the Bible. Here's the definition of a friend from the Bible. A friend loves, and this is in uh, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, if you want to write this down. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I want you to look at this. A friend loves at all times. No matter what's going on in your life, if you've got a friend, he loves you. She loves you at all times. Not just when things are going good. Not just when you're making them happy and giving them what they want. They love you at all times. At all times. Proverbs 18.24 says this, A man who has friends must show himself friendly. So I kind of put those two together in my mind, and I think, okay, I need a friend who loves me at all times. In my strengths, in my weaknesses, in my successes, in my failures, when I fall down, when I get up, I need someone who loves me at all times. And I need to love the same way. Because if I'm going to have a friend, I must show myself friendly, so I must have someone that I invest my life into much more deeper than what I do in my average acquaintances. Today, our relationships, I fear, are very fragile, not very deep, very superficial. We need, I'm talking to believers now, we need friends in our life, a friend in our life who will never, ever forsake us. I don't care what happens. I don't care how ugly we get or how pretty we look. In our lives, we need friends who won't forsake us. All right. So I want to share with you from the life of King David. Four points, I'll call them, on what it means to have a really close friend and to reach, as Christians now, to reach our full God-given potential. We need these kind of people in our life. So I want you to think about King David. We will... um, This air blows the pages up here, Pastor Tom. Uh, Got to keep that there. We're going to look at beginning in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. Chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, you might turn there to chapter 18. And I want you to think about David, for instance. And, and I know you probably all know the story of David and how David, God is... He's done with Saul as king of, 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 of Israel. He's done with Saul. Saul's been disobedient. He's not obeyed God. And God told Samuel, he said, Samuel, I want you to quit sitting around mourning about Saul and me getting rid of him. I'm paraphrasing, okay? But he says, I want you to go down to Jesse's house, the Bethlehemite, and I want you to anoint the next king of Israel. And Samuel kind of drags, what if Saul knows I'm going to do this? He's going to kill me. And God says, it's okay. Go down there. Say you're going to sacrifice. Invite them, Jesse and his boys to come. So, so Samuel goes down to the house of Jesse. And there he, he finds eight sons. But really, Jesse only brings out seven of them. And Samuel goes through the whole seven. And God says, not any of these. Jesse, you, you got, have, you got a, have you got another son somewhere? Oh, yeah, this, this kid out here, he's keeping a sheep. He said, we'll bring him in. And we don't really know how old David was, and I'm guessing he's probably a 12, 13, 14-year-old boy. I don't know. 
maybe a little older than that. And that's the one God wants. And Samuel anoints David, king of Israel. I want you to think about David. He's a young boy. God's done with Saul. He respects the kingship of Saul. This, this young man was taught to respect authority and to respect leadership, good or bad. He doesn't badmouth King Saul. He loves King Saul as the king of Israel. But now he's anointed king, and Saul's out. He goes back to keeping his sheep, okay? And there's a lot in between, but I want to skip to this, the, the, the war between the Philistines and Israel. You remember that little war? And they had this big old giant named Goliath. And Goliath, he'd come out every morning and the armies, and he'd just defy the armies of Israel and the army, the, the God of Israel, and he would make fun of them, and he said, send out one of your, one of your soldiers and we'll fight. And if you defeat us, we'll be your servants. If you defeat, if I defeat you, you'll be our servants. Nobody would go. Big King Saul, who says was a head taller than anybody else in Israel, he wouldn't go. No one wanted to go. So Jesse says to David, he said, David, I want to know how your brothers are doing. Three of the brothers fought in the war, and evidently David's young enough, he was not a warrior yet. So I want you to take a few vittles, and I want you to go down and see how things are going and come back and tell me how the boys are and how the war is going. So David goes. Well, he gets down there, and you all know the story. He, he sees what's going on, and David says, I'll defeat this guy. He can't defy the armies of the God of Israel. And they all make fun of him, of course, and his brothers are upset with him thinking he's trying to do something prideful. And David finally talks him into it. And you all know he took, he took a sling and five stones and he hit him the first shot right between the eyes. And big old Goliath falls down and David pulls out his sword and chops off his head. Victory for David. And Saul, who is this kid? Bring this kid to me. So here comes David with his head in to see old King Saul. And that's where we'll pick up here in chapter 18. The first point I want to make is a friend, you need, we need a friend in our life to challenge us to bring out the very best in us. And I want to share this with you and why I think this about this passage. Chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, guys, I want you to think about this. Jonathan is Saul's son. He's the heir to the king. He's the next king of Israel in line. And David's just had a great victory here, and it says... I don't know whether they knew one another. The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know. I think it's, it's something God did in the lives of these two men. And when he sees David, it says here, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. He loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. They had a draft in Israel. They drafted soldiers. And David just got drafted. He ain't going home no more. He's going to stay and fight for Israel. Then Jonathan, now I want you to think about David. I'm sure he's a little shaky here. He's been anointed king of Israel. I'm not sure he fully understands that. He is now standing before the real king of Israel with his son, Jonathan, and Jonathan is reaching out to David. Well, let me ask you, what should be the response here a little bit of Jonathan if we think in the natural? Anyone? Would he not be a little jealous? Oh, David's getting all the attention. I'm Saul's son. What's going to happen? doesn't happen. Saul 
for Jonathan and David, souls are knit together. This is Christian friendship. This is Christian fellowship that you see taking place here. I know it happened in the Old Testament, but it's what happens when God brings someone into your life and knits you together with them, and you love that person as your own soul. Listen to what Jonathan does. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant. They made an agreement with one another. And I think they made an agreement to let love one another and care for one another all the rest of their lives. Because he loved him as his own soul. Look at verse 4. And Jonathan took off his robe that was on him and gave it to David. With his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Wow. Did he prove his love for David? To me, he's saying to David, listen, David, you may be a little scared here. Now, I'm reading between the lines. I understand that. You might not fully understand what God's doing in your life, but I want you to know something, David. I see what God's going to do, and I am saying amen. And I'm putting my, I'm putting my whole being into making you the very best you can be. He gave him his robe, his sword, everything he had because he loved him as he loved his own soul. The next thing I want us to look at, and we'll find in the next chapter, chapter 19. If you turn to chapter 19, please. So everything is, well, I think everything's hunky-dory. David's in the army now. Saul's going to win a whole lot of victories. David goes out and just defeats enemy after enemy after enemy. Okay? Is everything well with David and Saul? No. What happens to Saul? Now, here's something we have to read from the Bible, and I don't fully understand this, but the Bible says from that time forward, God took his spirit away from Saul And Saul began to have severe times of depression in his life. Severe times. David even came a few times and would play for him and kind of soothe Saul down. They didn't have all the stuff we have today to give you to soothe you down, I guess. But David would come and play some music for him. But Saul is now very jealous of David. And Saul wants to kill David. Because, see, when David would go out to battle, the, when they come back and they had to be victory parade, the women would cry out, Saul slayed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Saul don't like that. Saul don't like that. And he misunderstands. I think probably in Saul's mind he's thinking, he's going to overthrow me. David would never do that. David had chances to kill Saul, and he never did it. Even when his own men said, there it is, David, get rid of him, and you'll become king. And David said no. See, David was a man who loved God very, very much. And he understood that if you love God, then you respect those in authority, even though they're bad. And Saul was not a good king from their time on. But there's another. When when David was anointed with with the oil, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon David and was with him from that time forward. That's what God did. He took the Spirit of God from one person who disobeyed him, and he poured his Spirit out upon another person who he knew would obey him and love him. So Saul misunderstands. So we find Jonathan here again standing up for David. And this is is my point here. The second point is a friend. We need a friend to protect us and stand up for us when we are misunderstood. Saul misunderstood David's motives. I really think he did. And in chapter 19, we begin reading verse 1. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, 
My father Saul seeks to kill you, therefore please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. David, I want to talk to my dad about you. And what I observe from him, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the truth, whatever I observe from him. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul's father. Now just think, Saul wants to kill David, I think Saul's even thinking, Jonathan, why do you want this guy around? You're the next king of Israel. But Jonathan spoke well of David to his father and said to him, I am not, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have not been good, have been good toward you. He's saying, Dad, look. Listen, David doesn't want any harm to come to you, and everything he has done for you, it's been good. He has never one time turned against you. And you're like, I know he's pleading, Dad, don't you understand? He doesn't want to hurt you. He's not going to overthrow your kingdom. He is, he is your best that you've got in the kingdom to protect you and to care for you. Verse 5, he he explains it to him. He says, For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood and to kill David without a cause? He's pleading the cause of his friend David to his father who has grown to hate David. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So Jonathan brought David to Saul. He was an intercessor, an interceder between someone who hated his friend and his friend that he's trying to present to his father in the right and correct way. That's friendship. Someone who will stand with you when you're totally misunderstood. That's friendship. Not somebody that will say something on Facebook, I'm sorry about you or for you. That person who will stand with you when you're totally misunderstood. Okay, let's look at the next point. A a friend to help you find strength in God and to help you grow in your faith. Now, I want you to go to 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. First Samuel 23. Let's get 15 through 18. Now, I know what Saul just said, okay, I, I, I got you, Jonathan, we're okay. Mm-hmm. And you all know that didn't last very long. Saul gets in one of his depressed fits again, and he's going to kill David. And he's chasing David with everything he's got in his army to kill David because he fears David, and he wants him done away with. It's going to last for a little while, this relationship when Jonathan brought David to Saul, and now Saul's angry again. So I want you to look in 15 through 18. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. He encouraged him in God. I'd like to have been there for that conversation. I really would have. But I think he said to David, David, look, I know what's happening here, but I want you to understand God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsaken you. 
you will be the next king of Israel, David, because that's what God has appointed. And my father will not destroy you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Don't look to see what's happening here. Don't look at the temporal things, David. You look at the eternal things. That's where your hope is. Your hope is not in the present situation you're in. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of, my, of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. Now listen to this. I, this is something. And I shall be a next to you. I shall be a next to you. The king's son says, I'll play second fiddle to you. I will be next to you. I'll be there with you, David, when you become king. Now listen, I don't think either one of these young men knew exactly what would happen to Saul or how God would deal with Saul. And I think Jonathan knew more so at this point than David did. It's okay, David. God has appointed you king, and you will be king, and my father will not get you. Wow. That's friendship. He encouraged him in the Lord. And look what he said. And the, and the Bible says here, So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. Now I want, I want you to pass over those last few sentences there. Where did David stay? I mean, God, God sent Jonathan, and he encouraged David, and wow, man, Everything's going to be okay. No. Your friend cannot deliver you from the woods you're in. I'm sorry. I've tried to do that with people. I had a cousin years ago. She lost two boys and her husband in a train wreck. They were, she was a 4-H leader, and she had left something at home, and they were traveling down Regan Road in the afternoon, and the sun, it was in the spring of the year, and the sun evidently was coming, and they didn't see the train or hear the train, and the two little boys and the father were all three killed at one time. As a young Christian, I thought some way I can deliver Beverly from the woods, I worked second shift. I'd stop at her house at night. And the lights would be on. And I, I, I wanted so much to deliver her from the woods. I couldn't do it. I can encourage her in the Lord, but I couldn't deliver her. Only God can deliver you from the woods and the wilderness, but you need a friend to encourage you in the Lord. You see, Jonathan went back to his house, He wasn't in the woods, but his friend was. You can't deliver your friend from the woods. you got to trust the Lord. you got to encourage him in the Lord, but you can't deliver him. And I believe me, in my life, I've tried a hundred times to deliver people I loved who were Christians from the woods, and only God can do it. But I want to keep encouraging them in the Lord. Set your, set your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and run this race with perseverance until someday we see him face to face. And if he doesn't deliver you in this life, I can assure you this, when you either pass through death or when Jesus returns, you will be delivered. Look at the eternal, not the temporal. Okay. I want, to, I want to share with you a little bit. I've talked a lot about Jonathan here, but in 2 Samuel 1.26, and you all know this, Jonathan and, Sam, and, and Saul were both killed in battle later on. And David mourned for them. He mourned for them. 
And in 2 Samuel 126, listen to what David says about Jonathan. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of a woman. Yeah, I, in the day and age in which we live, breaks my heart. Somebody will misunderstand. I hope no one in this congregation does. But David mourned for Jonathan because the affection that Jonathan had for him was greater than a woman. And I want you to think what God said from the very beginning. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's intimate relationship. That's close. That's someone who, who's there when you're hurting and in your pain. And he says of Jonathan, he said, Jonathan, your love for me surpassed the love of a woman. Your affection. And we as Christians, every one of us needs someone in our lives who is like that, who loves us more than a woman. I'm talking to Christians now. You need that relationship, that fellowship with another person who is a Christian. Years ago, Dud Slack stood in this place I'm standing now. I'll never forget this when the computers come out. And Doug Slack said, we're isolating ourselves. We're isolating ourselves. We get in our computers and our Facebook and all that. We're isolating ourselves. And Christians, we can't do that. We need people in our lives who care for us intently. And they care for us not just for what happens to us physically and financially and emotionally. They care for us. They care for our soul. Because you see, God loves your soul. He loved it so much, he died on the cross for your soul. And we need friends in our lives like that. Lastly, I'd like for us to look at another friend David had. And you all know this story pretty well. You'll, you'll find this, this story and uh, this situation uh, in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12. hope I wrote that down right. <laughs> yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And you all remember this story. And this is, this is the one that's important. We need a friend to tell us the truth. And we do not want to hear it. We need a friend. I'm not talking about an acquaintance. I'm talking about a friend who loves us more than love in a marriage relationship. They care for us immensely. And we need that friend to tell us the truth. And we don't want to hear it. You all know the story. David, he should have been out in battle. He wasn't. He was at home. He was taking an afternoon nap, evidently. He gets up in the evening. He looks out, and there he sees a lady. Her name was Bathsheba. And you all know what he did. He sent his servant, got Bathsheba. She comes in. I don't have to tell you what happened there. She comes up pregnant. She comes up pregnant. And David's got it all figured out how he's going to solve this problem. Sin is so deceitful in our lives, folks. It's so deceitful. So David said he, he just calls Uriah home from a battle. And for you men all know, if you've been out in a battle for a while and you come home, you know, I'm going home to my wife. But see, at this time, Uriah is more honorable than David. Uriah says, I'm not going into her till the war's over. The people I fight with are out there in the battle, and I'm not going into my wife. And he just slept on the steps. So then David says, okay. I mean, they come back telling David, all right, I got, the, I got the answer. I'll have him. We'll have a big dinner together. I'll get him drunk. And then I'll send him back to his wife. And I don't know. I doubt if Uriah got drunk because he didn't go home. 
He slept with the servants that night. But then David says, well, I got that figured out. I know what I'll do now. I got to cover this up. I, I know what I'll do. I'll send you ride to the front lines. And when he gets out there, I'll have every, the army just kind of retreat. And he'll, that'll be the end of it. Well, it works. David murdered Uriah. He didn't kill him, Pastor Tom. He murdered him because he conceived. You know, war and murder are two different things. When you kill in war, that's different than the murder. Okay? But in this instance, because David contrived in his mind how to cover this up, he murdered Uriah. After Uriah dies, he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. Everything's okay, right? I, I, I got this covered up. You ever try to cover sin in your life? It don't work. God will find you out. So let's look at verse tw- or chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. You know, Pastor Tom, that's where somebody, when God said go, can you imagine Nathan uh, to the king? I don't know that I want to go. But Nathan goes. And he came to him and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor, and the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, and the poor man had nothing except his one little lamb, which he had brought and nourished, and he grew it up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank uh, from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man. He refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd, to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. I want to tell you something. The man that came to David is the same man, if we're not careful, will come to us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will take us down. You see, when David looked out and saw Bathsheba, all three of them were working in his life, I think. He, the lust of the eyes, he's seen her, she was beautiful. The lust of the flesh, the flesh says, I want to have intimate relationships with her. And the pride of life said, I'm the king, I can have whatever I want. The worst person that can come to you is your lust. It's not somebody else. The problems we have on, in our lives are not because of that person, they're because of this person, the old man in us, and the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the spirit, they war against one another. And when we obey the lust of the flesh, we end up in trouble every time. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Boy, David's righteous now, isn't he? Well, that's terrible. That rich man took advantage of that poor man, and he, and he took his sheep, the one little lamb he had, and he butchered it for, his, for this person who came to visit him. Ah, just have his head. And, he's, and he shall restore fourfold, verse 6, for the lamb, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Wow. Sometimes a friend must say to you, you're the one at fault here. Quit covering it up, quit blaming others, quit thinking you got away with something. You need that friend in your life. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I, will anoint you, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. And I gave you from the house of Israel and Judah. And, it, and if that had not been enough, I also would have given you much more. You have despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. 
and it didn't. David had trouble from that time on. His family was a mess. Sad. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up an adversary against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. And his son Absalom did that. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned. David finally comes out as a deception, and he realized, you know, when we're busy covering up sin, God help us. We just need to say, Lord, I have sinned, and quit trying to cover it up. For you did it secretly. Okay, uh, sorry. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Thank God for the grace of God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, even David's sin here. However, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. Sometime a friend has to tell you there are consequences for your sin. A friend has to tell you that. And you may not want to hear that. We all need a friend. Today we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. And he truly is our friend. He should be the number one friend in our life. But he wants to bring another, other friends into our life to speak truth into our life so he can give us di divine directions in our everyday decisions in life. Praise his name. If there's anyone here today and you say, well, I'm not a Christian. I don't have a friend like that. I want to share with you, because they didn't share all this verse from, from Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and Jesus Christ is the person who loves at all times. And a brother who is born for adversity. You see, one thing, when you come into Christian fellowship, and you have a friend in Jesus, you have a brother, the elder brother, and he loves you at all times. And Proverbs 18.24 says, A man who has friends must show himself friendly. But the last part of that verse says, But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. And if you're here today, I know primarily this, this message is for Christians and how to find divine direction. But if you haven't started that journey yet, I want to share with you, but there is one named Jesus who is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He died on a cross for you. He shed his blood for your sins. He gave his all for you. Everything he had, he gave for you that you might be forgiven, set free, free from your sins. The Bible says he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Free from your sins. And he gives you a home in heaven, an eternal life, something to look beyond to, something beyond the woods you may feel like you're in and the forest you may feel like you're in. He says, I give you the hope of eternal life. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. All he asks of you is that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and the Bible says, you say, I'll be saved. It's that simple. It's not complicated, folks. And when you begin that journey, you'll find all these things we've talked about along the way here. Start, stop, stay, go, serve, connect. He will help you do. He will help you. And what I say to you is, if you make that decision today, tell someone. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, 
I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. That's all he asked for you. To as many as received him, the Bible says, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe upon his name. He loves you. Father, we thank you today for our time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the life of Jonathan and even the life of David as we look at these two friends and even Nathan who, because you instructed him, was bold enough to go to a friend and say, you're that man. You have sinned, David. Lord, help us in our lives as Christians. And if someone here is just starting that life, today they may made that decision to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray that you, by your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit, would help us to live it out. Only you can do that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In closing, I'll say one thing, a couple things to you. Our pastor hammers. He uses that term, put the hammer down. I, I shouldn't use that. He pleads with you, encourages you, desires for you to be in Sunday school or in a small group. I'm not guaranteeing you you'll find a friend there like Jonathan, but I want to tell you something. You're exposing yourself to a place where you can find a friend or friends like that. So if you expose yourself to a small group or a Sunday school class, you can develop that friendship. Now, you, God may do it somewhere outside of here, okay? And that's fine. We all need a friend. God bless you. And may the Lord keep you and shine his face upon you. Amen.